Hey, how's it going? My name is Dr. Malsberg. I'm a psychiatrist and multimedia editor in chief at Carlat, and I make videos under the name of Psychopharm. This video is going to be an off label guide to using gabapentin. So let's get started. Gabapentin, the brand name's Neurontin, is not a medication that would make the FDA proud. Less than 1% of its outpatient use is for an FDA indication, and a good portion of the off label use takes place in psychiatry. These trends sparked the backlash in the 2000s when Pfizer paid a $1.3 billion fine for misleading marketing practices. Recent reports of misuse of gabapentin and its cousin, pregabalin, brand name Lyrica, have added to these concerns. In this video, we're going to look at where gabapentin fits in to psychiatric practice. If you want to follow along, I recommend checking out our fact sheet on gabapentin. To get free access, just go to thecarlatreport.com slash gabapentin, and we'll email you a free helpful fact sheet. The first indication we're going to look at is in anxiety disorders. So gabapentin may be effective for social anxiety and panic disorders at a dose of 900 to 3600 milligrams per day. The supporting clinical trials are industry sponsored and while the methodology is solid, they're randomized, double blind, placebo controlled, but the studies are small. There's only two trials with a total of 172 participants. Other studies report benefits in non-specific anxiety such as before surgery and in breast cancer survivors, where it works better than placebo in two large trials with a total of 630 patients at a dose range of 300 to 1200 milligrams per day. By comparison, pregabalin has much better evidence in anxiety disorders with eight randomized control trials at a dose range of 150 to 600 milligrams per day, involving over 2000 patients with generalized and social anxiety disorders. Pregabalin sees more use for anxiety in Europe, where it has regulatory approval in generalized anxiety disorder, while U.S. psychiatrists lean towards gabapentin. The evidence is clearly in pregabalin's favor, but gabapentin does have a tolerability advantage, with lower rates of weight gain and ataxia. The next indication is in addiction. So despite concerns about gabapentin misuse, the medication does have a role in alcohol and cannabis use disorders. To take it for alcohol use disorder, report fewer days of heavy drinking with an effect size in the medium range, 0.4, from seven randomized controlled trials. Gabapentin also improved sleep quality during recovery from alcohol use. The dose range was 300 to 3600 milligrams per day, with most settling in at about 900 milligrams per day. Gabapentin may also be useful in alcohol withdrawal, but with an important caveat. Although it's generally effective in controlled trials that compared it with benzos and phenobarbital, there were a few seizures during the gabapentin taper, not enough to raise statistical alarms, but enough to give us pause. It does improve cravings, anxiety, and sleep during withdrawal, so it may have a role as an adjunct to more established methods, like a benzodiazepine taper, or its use can be confined to patients with less severe dependence. A typical schedule starts at 1200 to 2400 milligrams per day in three or four divided doses, tapers to 600 milligrams per day over four to seven days, then drops in increments of 300 milligrams or smaller every few days until reaching zero. Alternatively, it may be continued for long-term treatment to prevent relapse, a use that is endorsed by the APA guidelines on alcohol use disorders. As for cannabis use disorder, we only have one controlled trial for gabapentin, but this limitation is tempered by the fact there are few pharmacological options for this disorder. In the small placebo-controlled study, Gabapentin reduced cannabis withdrawal symptoms, increased abstinence, and improved executive functioning. But gabapentin is by no means a cure-all for addictions. It failed in controlled trials of cocaine, methamphetamine, benzos, and opioid use disorders. Recent reports suggest particular caution in patients with opioid use disorder, as gabapentin may increase the risk of overdose and hospitalizations in this group. Moving on to bipolar disorder, so long ago, there was a consensus in psychiatry that all anticonvulsants had anti-manic effects. In 2000, gabapentin became the first anticonvulsant to challenge that idea, with a negative trial in bipolar mania that was followed by similar disappointments from topiramate and oxcarbazepine. Gabapentin is not reliable on its own in bipolar disorder, but two placebo controlled trials suggest it may have a role as adjunctive therapy. It augmented lithium in acute mania and had mild preventative effects over a year when added to various mood stabilizers. As encouraging as these results are, both came from small trials with a total of only 85 patients. 
In practice, gabapentin is best reserved for treating bipolar disorder in patients with comorbidities like anxiety and alcohol or cannabis use disorder. The next indication we're going to look at is restless leg syndrome and pain. So gabapentin has only three FDA indications, partial seizures, post-herpetic neuralgia, and restless leg syndrome. Although it's used widely in pain disorders, it only has clear benefits in post-herpetic neuralgia and diabetic peripheral neuropathy. And it's not considered effective for low back pain, sciatica, spinal stenosis, or migraines. Gabapentin's restless leg syndrome approval is actually only reserved for gabapentin and carbol. This is a prodrug that delays absorption by attaching the medication to another molecule. However, there are a few reasons to prefer the original gabapentin when treating restless leg syndrome. The PDR warns of significant driving impairment for two hours after taking the medication, and it has more toxicity risk than the original gabapentin. So even though the original gabapentin is lacking in FDA approval, it was effective in restless leg syndrome in half a dozen small studies. The usual dose here is 300 milligrams before bed, but studies have gone as high as 2,400 milligrams. The next set of indications we're gonna look at are akathisia, sleep, and hot flashes. So treatments for restless leg syndrome often reduce akathisia, and gabapentin has promising results for this antipsychotic side effect as evidenced in open-label trials at doses of 300 to 3,600 milligrams per day. Gabapentin is also often used as a hypnotic, and this is supported by small controlled and open-label trials where it improves sleep duration and quality, where it increased slow-wave sleep at 200 to 900 milligrams per day. In practice, this means gabapentin may not help your patients fall asleep faster, but it can deepen their sleep and reduce nocturnal awakenings. Women with postmenopausal vasomotor symptoms are good candidates for this hypnotic use, as gabapentin reduced hot flashes in several controlled trials. What are some of the risks we see with gabapentin? So gabapentin has no serious warnings, but common adverse effects include sedation, fatigue, dizziness, imbalance, tremor, and visual changes from nystagmus. Here's a list of a few helpful dosing tips. So gabapentin is one of the rare psychiatric meds with nonlinear pharmacokinetics. That means that serum levels start to plateau after a certain dose and rise sluggishly from there. So for gabapentin, that dose is 900 milligrams. At doses above this, less and less of the drug is absorbed. This slowdown occurs because the transporters that absorb gabapentin are easily saturated at higher doses. We know that gabapentin is excreted entirely by the kidneys, which means it avoids hepatic drug interactions but it also means that the dose needs to be lowered as creatinine clearance declines. That's a common problem in our older patients. With a six hour half-life, gabapentin can be divided three times daily for anxiety disorders, but also dosed at bedtime for sleep disorders. And lastly, when stopping the medication, taper gradually to avoid withdrawal symptoms, which are rare, but do include tremor, sweating, restlessness, insomnia, and importantly, a lower threshold for seizures. So what's the CARLAT verdict? Gabapentin is probably used more often than evidence supports. Consider it for alcohol and cannabis use disorders and insomnia with hot flashes or nocturnal awakenings. Both pregabalin and gabapentin are effective in anxiety disorders, but pregabalin should be tried first as it has better data. If you found this video helpful, definitely head on over to thecarlatreport.com and consider subscribing to the CARLAT Psychiatry Report where we give you unbiased news for all things psychiatric with useful clinical updates, expert interviews, and bottom line assessments of the latest research studies. And subscriptions give you access to post-tests where you can earn CMEs.